So we will begin with our uh, fourth talk by Arvid. Yes, so welcome to this unpleasant lecture. Some years ago, I decided that I will never lecture this again. Let's write a book, then people can read it. There's no reason to lecture it. But this is an exception, so I will do it anyway. So today is the computation of local formal moduli, also called a hull. So, I start with defining what this is. So, what we know is that if F is any covariant functor from a category into sets, then we have a bijection from F of C into the morphisms from the morphisms from the point functor more C bar into sets. For any object C in the category C. That was our final statement last time. In our situation, in our situation, we have the deformation functor, def M. You can put an A up there if you want to, if it's A modules, but we can drop it also, from L hat into sets. And we have used some time to define what the category L hat is and anything. So now we use this for, in this case, and then we have, if I have an element H in here, in L hat, then I have an isomorphism from deformations of M to H. This is isomorphic to the morphisms. We are just filling in for this particular functor. Morphisms from H bar into def M. So for each deformation to H, I get the morphism from this into this one. And that is even unique. So, now I want to give some properties of these morphisms. So this is the definition. Phi going from morphisms from H bar into sets, into the deformation functor, like this. is, first of all, it is an isomorphism at tangent level. If if when I put in the ring of dual numbers, which is the tangent level, that is morphisms from H to E into def M of E, if this is a bijection. 
or an isomorphism of sets. So I will say it is an isomorphism at tangent level. It is an isomorphism at the tangent level. Just to point out that. Two, it is called smooth. And this is a general principle. It is called smooth, or the categorical name is essentially subjective. Essentially subjective. If for each, and it's enough to consider small, Morphism from S to R in L, we define small morphisms. That was the subjections such that the kernel times the radical was zero. And I can compose every morphism from S to R in L hat in small morphisms. Therefore, it's enough to define this for, for small morphisms. Because now we have a diagram from more age S into def M S and the deformation factor is covariant. So more H R S maps to R. So we have the morphism down here into def M R going down here. For each search morphism, we have this one. And then I can take some phi r line here. Then this maps to a morphism, excuse me, to a deformation in here. That was an r tensor k to the out a module. So this one maps to this one. Assume that there exists a lifting here, MS, mapping to this one. That's the assumption. Then there should exist phi S in here, mapping down to this one and to this one simultaneously. This is the concept of smoothness. And in fact, you can see that this is non-singularity if you work in the category of algebras. That's why we use the name smooth. Originally, deformation theory was used to classify singularities on algebraic schemes. And that's why we choose the name smooth. So, MR can be lifted to MS via this one. And here we also see how we can construct the hull. So we will need this. So, a new definition. I think now comes the definition of the hull. Remember that we are trying to, to approximate a pro-presenting hull. I, we cannot expect to find a really pro-representing object, so we have to approximate it, and that is the hull. It was pro-representing if this was an isomorphism, always. But we can't expect it to be an isomorphism. But anyway, Consider H M tilde. What is H? Well, H is an element in L hat. M tilde is in def M H. Like this. This is what Schlesinger called a couple. Of course, it is a couple. It is one element in the category and one element that is a deformation to H.
and let phi m tilde. This is the anamorphism from H bar into deformations of M. Why is this so? Well, we have chosen an H and we have an isomorphism here. So choosing an element M tilde down here gives us in fact the morphism Fm tilde going here to here. So this is the result of this pi m tilde, because m tilde is there. And then h m tilde is called, well, let's use a then. It is called pro-representing. If phi m tilde is isomorphism is an isomorphism that is off functors on AR. Okay, I'm sorry. I copy the old version, so it, there is AR, of course. We are working with AR. So all the way where I put A hat, I meant AR hat. Okay, <laughs> this is because this is, the, this is a non-commutative version. So if this, in fact, is an isomorphism, then it is called pro-representing. But that happens only when there exists a moduli scheme. And usually, it doesn't exist a moduli scheme. B, it is called a representing hull. If it is next best, if it is smooth, so it can be lifted smoothly to the top, meaning that we are ending up with an etal isomorphism, as long as it is an isomorphism on the tangent level. And an iso on the tangent level. So oh, this was possible to understand, I think, at least for me. The next is much harder, <laughs> even for me. So, okay. We need to tell this, that pro-representing objects, pro representing objects they are unique up to unique isomorphism if I have a H that is a pro-representing object, then it is unique. Having a, another pro-representing hull, it will be isomorphic after a unique isomorphism. The problem is that hulls, they are unique, given two pro-representing pro hulls, a smooth and an isomorphism at the tangent level. They are unique, but up to non-unique isomorphism.
And that is simply because when we are completing a sequence, then we can multiply by 1 divided out by 1 minus x in the power series ring. So it is a non-unique isomorphism. But we are very satisfied with, an, with, the, with the uniqueness anyway. Okay, so then is the exercise. Construct a hull, and that is both in the algebra, K algebra H, and the family M tilde. <coughs> could just give you that exercise. But of course, that's, that's the main goal to do this, to do this here. So then I need first, firstly, I need an obstruction theory. Because I understand that I can start by putting h equal to this e because then I have, I have an isomorphism. Then I can try to lift it, finding to the next step, dividing out by the radical to the, to the third. So I have all second-degree monomials, and I can lift it up there. But then I need to know when can I, can I lift it. So I compute an obstruction for lifting it, and I divide out by all the, all the obstructions, and I can lift it. And that's the point, that's why I need the obstruction theory. So, let, okay, I can write the sequence and comment it afterwards. Zero to, to i, ij, big i, ij, into s, which is an element in ar, does it look like sij? And it maps by some phi, a small morphism, to Rij, which is then some other ring R, which is equal to zero, and this is small. Okay, so I have a small morphism, take any small morphism from S to R. Then I have a kernel, ij. So this ij is just the kernel of this. Then there exists <coughs> an obstruction O. Oh phi m r, which in fact is in I write it like this, i a j, which is this, this will be a matrix, i a j tensor over k with x to a M I M J Whew. I mean some of you thought that it was very hard to compute X2 and yes it is very hard to compute X2 it's not so hard to compute X1 which gives us the tangent space but it's hard to compute X2 but now I have an abstraction that is in X2 and the only thing I need is the linear dependency between the elements in the X2 space. So the problems with computing X2 turns out to be a less problem. With this, it's an explicit object. I will compute it explicitly, and it lies here. The kernel is rather explicit when I have small morphisms, and these are just these quiver algebras. 
and everything can be computed. But it is such that MR can be lifted to S if and only if the obstruction for lifting O phi MR is equal to zero in X2. Okay, so then the idea is really to find a basis for this kernel. Then write out the polynomials or the coefficients and writing up those monomials or polynomials in the kernel such that this is zero. I divide out by the kernel such that this is zero. Then I can lift all the way to the top. That's the idea. And I get some polynomial to divide out by. Bernard Keller makes his A infinity structures. And then he assumes that every time he does his massive products, then they will be zero. If not, they are not defined. We are a bit more trickier. We divide out so that they are always defined. This means that we need some, some more structure to it. So, but we, we have to prove this. So that you see it. So, proof and in such, what do you call it in English? Goose something? Design. It is not a proper. Always think of I have some K and I have some TIJs, some matrix. And this maps divided out by some m to the n plus 1. And I map this one down to kt over the m to the n. This is a typical small morphism. And our algebras all look like this one, plus some relations, of course, plus some relations. At the first step, we are divided out by m squared, and this is the tangent space. Then this is, then there are no relations yet. The relations are the one I'm going to build. So, this is just to, to put some understanding in your, in your brains before we start. So, a lifting of MR, which is then equal to, because it should be flat, it is <coughs> isomorphic as R module to Rij tensor over K MJ. So, this is given, and I want to lift the structure. So, okay, there's a diagram here. A is mapped into by row R, which is a structure morphism, into R I J tensor of a K M J. This is defined already because I started with a right R module. So then I have an A module structure 
And by R linearity, this x is extended to R tensor over kmj. So this is the one given. And then, of course, I have, because we have a small morphism, I have a morphism from Sij tensor over k m j down here as k vector spectrums. Of course, I have. And this is also k linear, of course. So, working with linear algebra, I can always find a morphism here. At the S, I choose a K linear morphism. But this might not be A linear. This might not be an A module homomorphism. So I just put a tilde on it because this is the one I'm going to adjust if the obstruction is not zero. And anyway, I have the kernel of this morphism, which is I, A, J. Tensor over k, m, j. And this is the kernel. I choose a lifting, eta tilde. Well, it is k linear. But why do it respect linearity? Eta S tilde of A times B is that equal to eta S, eta tilde of A times eta tilde of B. There's no reason why this should hold. Because here I have something in a kernel which is included in the definitions. So, in fact, that's the problem. That's the main problem. And that is exactly the obstruction. Okay. So now I've chosen those, this eta tilde. So, for each pair, A, B, in A, then I have that Eta S tilde of A times B minus this eta S tilde of A times eta tilde of eta tilde S of B. What is this? Okay. So if I, if I then take this morphism and map this object down here, then this commutes with this row R. And this is an A-model homomorphism. So then this element maps to zero down here. So it is in the kernel. So for each pair AB, this is an element in I, IJ, tensor over K, hom K, MI, MJ. And this represents, so, O pi m r, the obstruction for lifting, was it pi really? What was the theorem? Yes, it was phi. <laughs> So, the obstruction for lifting phi to MR is equal to the class of eta S of A, B, and 
and then tilde of course, minus eta s tilde of a times eta s tilde of b. I see now that the correct answer you should ask me is that how can this be true? What is this hum up there? And that easy to explain? Because this one, to give an A molder structure, is this into hum. K. M I M J, of course. The same here. Hom K M I M J. The same up here. Hom K M I M J. That's the point. That is to give a name model homomorphism. Not into the model, into the hom of the model. So that was a mistake, and I, I will change this in the notes. But I see here that the miss. Okay, in the notes it just missed home, even the parenthesis is within. So the point is that this is in, in here, taking the class. This is an element in I, A, J, tensor over K, and then in the second Hochschild cohomology, which is the same as X. But we have defined the Hochschild cohomology, so, so let us use that. Let's shift a bit from now to there. H2, home K, M I M J. This is the obstruction. If this obstruction is zero, if O pi MR is equal to zero, there exists some, then there is, exists a one call cycle mapping to it. There exists a psi, And that's a one call cycle, so it's a mapping from A into home K. M I M J. Mm -hmm. Search that. such that d1 of xi is equal to o, or is equal to, okay, to o. At least if I call this expression for o. So that the obstruction is a class of o. There exists Xi. Mapping to this one. Put, no, I adjust eta s by putting it equal to eta s tilde plus this Xi which is mapping from A into home K, M, I, J. So it has the same target. So I can add it to this one. Then, then I get eta S of A, B with this new construction is equal to, <laughs> steady now, Eta S tilde of A B 
plus xi of a b. And I can this one, okay, minus because this was yes, okay. Oh, what what am I saying? No, no strange that this was wrong. Minus eta s tilde of a times eta s tilde of b. So this is then eta s tilde of a b plus xi of a b. That was the first one with this definition. Minus, and I get eta s of eta s tilde of a plus xi of a times eta s tilde of b plus xi of b. So then, what is this? If I compute this, I get eta s tilde of a b. If I keep this one, this one multiplied by that one would be minus eta s tilde of a times eta s tilde of b. And I get minus this one times this one. But no, CA was a lifting. So this times this one is minus A times eta S of B. I didn't forget XI. This is lower down, so then it is ordinary multiplication. A times eta S of B. And I have okay, well. and I have minus eta s of a times b. This is this eta s of a times psi of b, which is then b because we are lower down. And we have one element which is minus xi a times xi b. But this, this was a small morphism. So this one is zero, because there are two elements in the kernel that are multiplied together. So this is zero. So then this is O, and this is, in fact, D of Xi, because I chose D of Xi, D1 of Xi to be O. So this is, yeah, or minus O is equal to this one, so I get O minus O, and the complete expression is zero. So then I prove that if it could be lifted, then the obstruction is zero. No, I prove that if it is zero, then it can be lifted. The other way is trivial, more or less. Then I, then I could choose these etas at once. And I just had the obstruction to be zero, if it could be lifted. So this is the obstruction theory. This was not too bad. No. I think it, it went better than it used to do. OK? Exactly. And that's maybe the hard thing to understand here. Because xi is a lifting to the ring. 
it's a, it's a lifting up to the to the to the s level so when we lower it down it's just ordinary a multiplication that's the reason for removing the excise if you did some examples you would see it immediately so I recommend that, but that takes, of course, a lot of time just to write, write up. Laudal won't, he doesn't allow me to call it this, but I do. Anyway, he's a very nice guy, so it's no problem. Laudal structure theorem. It says that let T1 be equal to tensor algebra TK to the art over, and I know I use X, X1 A M I M J, and I put dual. So, why do we put dual? Well, the tangent space is really the duals. So, we con consider the dual. And then I can say two things at once if I let Ti. I can let this be an I. Okay. And I can let I be equal to 1, 2. Okay. Maybe such such things. So I can take the tensor algebra. I mean, this is just a vector space. X does a vector space. I have to assume that this vector space is finite dimensional. It works anyway, but if we assume that, it's much easier. So I have T1 and I have T2. That is two tensor algebras on the known form. Then there exists an obstruction morphism O. Oh. From T2 to T1, T2 is the X2s containing the obstructions into T1s, which are the whole, such that the pro representing hull H is equal to T1 tensor over T2 via this O with K to the art. So this is the pro representing hull. Pro representing hull. Okay, so, but we have to say what, what this means. We have to say what this means because it, it seems very complicated, <clears throat> but it, it's not. This says that, so the theorem is this one, but it says that T1 is equal to K and then K to the art, in fact, with some matrices Tij and Lij. With this notation I use like this, I think, like this. That is E1, where this is the basis for X1 dual, X1 dual. Each of the X are assumed to have dimension Lij, 
and you recall all this notation, which is compactified here. And I divide out by some polynomials or power series, or they are power series, at least in the start, fij of hij. where this power series, fij, of some l, I mean, this is just a dimension of x2, they are the values of the obstruction morphisms of y, i, j, of h, i, of h, where this is the basis for x2. So this is in x2, m, i, m, j. So what we are saying is that there is a morphism, obstruction morphism, so that we just take the value of this O, and we have the monomials defining the pro representing help. And to construct this morphism is of course, not very easy. Okay, this is this is marvelous. Twenty-five minutes. That's exactly how long I can cope with this proof. Just see how long they come, and you will see the rest yourself. Proof. So now the point is to lift at each stage. It is to start with S2. Put S2 equal to K to the art, and then is Tij of Lij, and I put a bar under to say that there are Lij of them, and I divide out by I squared the radical square. That is just all the Tij's to the second. Well, this is not, this is not the ring of dual numbers, but it is closed. For each T, it is the ring of dual numbers. So we have an isomorphism deformations of this M, which is the sum of all the MIs, of S2, this is isomorphic to X1A, MI, MJ, dual. Okay, because this was an isomorphism on the tangent level. And really, we have to see, that is what I said, I put each, each of the base element in X2 in front of these Tij's, as I did in the proof that it was an isomorphism on the tangent level. So this isomorphism is given by taking a dual X and then define the lifting with Xi as about there, putting the Xi in front of the Tij's for each A. So we have this isomorphism. Thus, morphisms from S2 to S2 divided by I squared is isomorphic to the deformations of M to S2. Okay, then I know the tangent space of the pro representing hull. It is S2. So, a sequence of elements 
alpha bar, which is then alpha ij lij, use the notation as you like, in x1 a mi mj, this should be a matrix, it defines a deformation m2 alpha bar in def m s2. by putting it in front of all the TIJs. So this was the basis element coming from here. So now we are going to choose monomial basis. Let B to prime. All monomials of degree two. All monomials of degree two in the TIJs, of course. Yeah, okay. And consider pi three prime, which then maps from R three to okay. I can write up what it is. It is K T I J L I J divided by the radical to the third, mapping into, okay, this same K, T bar IJ, LIJ, divided out by I squared, which is S2. So now I will try to lift it up there. Because if it, if it is smooth, then it should be possible to lift it up there. In fact, H is the least, or H is defined by the greatest ideals, the smallest ideal, such that I can lift all the way to the top. So, the usual thing to do then is just to divide out by all monomials at each stage. And that's okay, but then you get new monomials for each stage. And the point with this algorithm is to take the first and to build on the same set of polynomials. So that this O, in fact, gives one polynomial for each base element in Y2. And that's the point. And that's what most people misunderstand. And then this is only technical. I mean, I choose it like this. So, M2 of alpha. What was that? Well, it was the deformation given by these alphas up here. This is called the defining system. A defining system. For the second order also generalized massive products, second order gen generalized massive products. And I name it by alpha bar T bar when T bar runs to B to prime. What is this? Is the correct answer. And I say that, okay, I just I haven't defined them yet. I just give it, I have defined the defining systems. To define these massive products, I need the defining system. So, no, they will be defined.
So. Go to star for this definition. So this will come. Choose basis. So <laughs> you see, this is uh, you have to prepare this to lecture it because otherwise it's, it's impossible. So choose basis. Y i j. Well, m i j. Why not h i j? For for the dual spaces x two. A, M, I, M, J, dual. And write then the obstruction for lifting M2 given by the alphas with pi 2 prime. It must be. P3 prime the obstruction for lifting M2 alpha in P2 prime it is in I tensor X2 so I have chosen a basis for X2 in fact I don't have to choose this basis before I have written up the next sequence and that's when we actually do it, it is like that. And this is the thing that we can actually do. So I let it be the sum of a T bar in B2 prime, which was the set of all secondary degree monomials. And that's the one lying in the kernel. Or everything of degree two maps to zero here. So I can write it like T bar which is some monomial of degree two times some coefficient because this is the basis alpha bar T bar. So this is just some coefficient, which is, is, which is then equal to the sum when T runs through B to prime of y i j of m i j we call that that this was a dual basis so i can let this act on this element alpha bar t bar Oops times t bar, tensor, and then I get the polynomial on the other side. Y, I, J, U, because now it's a base element, of H, I, J. So this star, there is where you should go to star, and that was maybe a dagger instead, go to dagger, because star is the dual. So, of course, this is a basis, monomial basis, so I have some coefficients. Then I could move it, and I can let this be the dual, and write this in front of the base element of x2. So then this is a polynomial each in front of each base element in A2. So, put Fij2 of Hij equal to the sum when T runs through B2 prime of Yij Mij Oops, H I J of this second order massive product alpha bar 
t bar times t bar. Okay, so now I have polynomials, each three space element in x2, and I put s3 equal to r3 divided out by, well, it was i cubed as before, plus all these second degree monomials, plus f i j 2 of a i j. I don't expect you to follow this, but anyway, now I have killed out by the obstructions and trying to lift this one, I will get the same expression, but no, everything in front of this one in X2 is in fact modeled out. So the obstruction for lifting will be zero. What we are doing? Okay. So I take this one, I take an element in M2, which is in fact the universal element at the tangent level because it's defined by this isomorphism. So I consider this morphism, now I have a deformation here, which is the universal deformation on the tangent level, and I will try to find the least ideal so that I can lift it up to R3. So I write the obstruction like this. First, I put all the base elements in I, that is the kernel of I, of the first I, IJ, the kernel here, is all second degree elements. I let the coefficients in X2 be the second order massive products. And then, I shift the basis, so I don't use the basis in I, I use the basis in X2 instead, so that everything in front of this is the monomials Fij. Then I divide out by this one, and I know that it can be lifted to the next step. And there are, there are of course, not very much time again, so the point is that if we choose bases now in various steps, in clever ways, we can always get... I'm no jumping because... We now define all higher order defining systems. And in fact, we end up with... The reason I, I chose this was, in fact, because Bernard Keller is coming. And I didn't know that he wasn't there. But he's the one who defined infinity structures. And then we have defined massive products in a different way than he does. So it would be fun for him to see it. Or, or maybe not, but it would it be fun to, to show it to him. So. We continue here, and we choose clever basis, clever monomial basis. And the point is that we don't divide out by these polynomials at each stage. We build on the old polynomials. So that, in fact, when we do this process, we end up with F, I, J, of h i j to be the sum from l is zero to infinity of the sum when l no when t this is a monomial runs through some monomial basis clever chosen where l runs from zero to infinity and i get all this y i j of the massive products that can be computed this way. And you can, you can, in fact, forget everything and just compute the massive products. 
And this is then the dual of x. And multiply this one by t. Then you have all the monomials. And they are as many as there are elements in x2. Of course, if you can compute this modular space, then a simple thing that x2 is zero says that the local ring has no relations. So it's non-singular. And that's the most applied use of this result, is to say that the modular space of, modular space of such and such is non-singular. Or, the other hand, to say that there is a certain singularity in the modular space. Take a modular space, compute its hull, then you have the singularity, and then you even, you can look at the Lie algebra of this singularity, and you get the Dinkin diagram. And, and that's the thing that relates all this. Okay, so. So then, this is the, is in fact the final result, and then, what I am doing, notice the following. I think I will end with this, this result. I can mention that I was asked to do a real example with this one, with non-commutative modules over a non-commutative ring. And I was asked to do it both in Hochschild cohomology and in the Yoneda complex. And I did that for this guy because I thought I was kind to him. But then I observed that if this system, in fact, is an is a infinity structure, if this massive product gives an infinity structure, then these are polynomials. And that, that's a nice result. But that is not what I'm going to tell you. I say that I have, if k is algebraically closed, then I have A mapping inje injectively into end H of M H. Well, what is this one? I have constructed a lifting at each stage. So this is the final lifting. And I take the endomorphisms over this ring H with M H which is, in fact, Hij tensor over k hom k mi mj. And we prove that this is injective. If, if the ring we started with was finite dimensional, then this is an isomorphism. Anyway, my point is to take the image of this one, call this O, which is inside here, and prove that this is in fact the localization in R points. Because this will be a finitely generated module with exactly these simple representations. And when I have such localizations, then I'm able to construct a non-commutative moduli scheme, giving the, using the Jacobson topology on the simple modules. And that's how far we have got in the, on the algebraic side. The next thing we are starting to is to find applications of this theory. So we, have, we try to do it in physics by using Lie group actions on the derivation algebras to get a physics implementation of it. But there, there, as you see, there is a lot of other things where we can apply this theory. We don't say that we can solve anything or everything, but some results can, be, can come from this theory. It can be applied to knot theory, it can be applied to cluster algebras, it can be applied here and there. 
my applications has been to invariant theory. That is the, because the, that's why I had the title of these lectures, which applies to graded modules, toric varieties, and the most funny example I did was to compute this ring for all orbits of GL3, the ring of endomorphisms of rank 3. Then we have three orbits parameterized by the agent's values in the Jordan composition, and we get a beautiful non-commutative space with some horrible equations which are possible to compute by hand. Okay, it took six months, but it's possible. So, I think I will stop there, and I think I illustrated my, my point. So, thank you very much. Ring of a certain module over over H. No, you, Im, you embed A into oh, the endomorphism. Yes. Okay. To given I, the embedding is to give. Well, it's it, it's easy to put it in here. H is the is the one I build up all the time here. So H is H is then S divided out by this one or this F with this x, and even put it like this, divide all, all, with all these monomials. Then, I always, all the time, I define the liftings by lifting, by giving the A module homomorphism in here. By putting elements in front of these Tij's all the time. So, so H non-commutative, absolutely non-commutative, and it is this. Oops. So it is really matrix multiplication. So, and it is possible to compute in particular examples. Any more questions? No more questions. Let's thank the speaker once again. So, uh, we'll not be having more lectures by him in the school because he'll be leaving uh, on the weekend. And uh, uh, we thank him from the bottom of our heart for coming here. And uh, also, we wish him the very best for his uh, personal and academic life we see him again and uh, also we wish him the very best with his uh, endeavors to f uh, apply his theory uh, in these uh, other areas um, as he mentioned and um, um, and any and uh, and uh, um, also other uh, area other fields of mathematics um, and of course as you know his notes are also uh, along with his uh, uh, board talks, he has also uh, uh, given us some notes which are uploaded on the website and you can always refer to them. And also there is his book uh, uh, written with Orphan Laudel, which you can also refer. And of course, uh, if you have, if you are interested in this, uh, in this topic, you can always write to him, I believe.